Okay, I'm gonna um I'm gonna tell you um, kind of an overview of the of the of the work we've been doing out at Jamaica Bay for the last uh, 20 years, and uh, some of the highlights of what we've learned during that time. Um, and um, and I'll give you a little start with giving you a little background, and then go into um, uh, you know what, what our work and what we've learned. Um, um, so I'm I'm gonna call this the tale of two turtles. It's really the tale of two turtle populations. Um, and um, and that'll become clearer, I hope, a, as we go. Um, I know that uh, as birders, you know, you mostly look at things that are up in the air. Uh, that's pretty common for birders who are up in trees. And uh, birders are, are, are in some ways like the worst people to talk to about turtles because turtles are always on the ground. But um, the turtles, these turtles are also in the water. And so I wouldn't be surprised if a number of you have seen terrapins um, while you've been out uh, on the water or even on the shore looking at the water because terrapins are, are, are pretty commonly uh, seen along shorelines and also at the surface when, when, when you're out in the water. So um, my interest in turtles, although I've done work on lots of other animals, turtles are very special to me um, because I'm fascinated by um, species that where, where individuals live a very long time. I myself would like to live a very long time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in what it means to live a really long time, what, 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 the, what, that, what that means for, 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 for uh, uh, individuals. And so the species that live a really long time, they, they invest very heavily in protection. Um, and they, of course, have high survivorship. That means year to year, you know, they have very low risk of being uh, uh, of dying from anything. Uh, inter interestingly enough, they often delay the first time that they reproduce. They don't reproduce until they're fairly late in life. And they tend not to senesce. That means they don't get very much weaker as they get older. And I wish that were true of us, but um, they don't they don't tend to get weaker as they get older until very, very late in life. Um, that means that they have many, many opportunities to reproduce. And each reproductive event means very few offspring and often parental care, or sometimes they have lots of offspring and low parental care. And among, among birds, you know, some of the fine examples among birds are uh, species like albatross, which um, uh, have high survivorship. Adult survivorship can be extremely high. Almost every adult lives, uh, you know, year to year. Um, they don't reproduce until fairly late in age, uh, uh, years and years before they start reproducing. And even in old age, they can forage for food. They can they can make babies. They can do all that all that kind of stuff. Which means they have lots and lots of years to try to reproduce. Year after year after year, they can try. They tend to have very few offspring, and they invest a lot in parental care. So as a result, their offspring have high high reproduction, high, high survivorship as well. Some examples among other animals include. Um, uh, something like the Greenland shark, uh, which uh, uh, you know we we have a hard time estimating for confidently how old they get, but there are individuals that are known to be at least 300 years old, and uh, some may live up to 600 years old. Um, elephants, you know, we often hold up as an example of long-lived things. They're really not extraordinarily long-lived, but there's animals go, they're pretty long-lived. They, they can easily live up to 70 years and they are model examples of rare reproduction and, and um, high survivorship among their young. They protect their young very, very uh, 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 carefully. And, and so high, almost every baby makes it to adulthood. Um, and one of the cool things about living a long time for any of these animals or even plants is that you live long enough to experience those unusual events that happen only rarely. Um, so you might live long enough to watch your favorite pond dry up, or you might live long enough to see, you know, your uh, a pond develop where one had never been before. You might live long enough to see the shoreline that you are used to using uh, 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 wash away. Um, and, and these are all things that any animal or plant that lives long enough is going to see these kinds of changes happen in the environment around them. And that's why acquiring knowledge and experience is really, really important to them. So they know how to deal with those things. You know, when, when, when the water hole disappears and is gone for five years, where else can you go for water? Um, if that food source uh, um, doesn't, uh, doesn't show up where it's supposed to, where else can you go? And so knowledge and experience is really important to animals that live a long time. The downside of living a long time and having all these characteristics is that you're really, really vulnerable to exploitation. What that means is that even if harvesting is going on at a fairly low level, it can totally crash a population. So elephants really have a hard time 
uh, surviving if even a small percentage of their population is taken every year by hunters. If even a small percentage can doom a population to extinction because they just don't respond very quickly to uh, you know, reductions in their population. They just don't do it very well. So turtles, tortoises, terrapins, all these different terms for what we're talking about here, they are also um, ex great examples of long-lived animals. They have that expensive shell. That's their, and I mean energetically expensive. That's 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 their investment in protection. They definitely have delayed uh, maturity. Some turtles don't start reproducing until they're at least 20 years old. Um, and of course, they live a really long time, not as long as those Greenland sharks, but some turtles certainly live over 200 years. They're on the one side, they don't protect their young or their eggs, so they, they, um, they have high mortality of the eggs and young. On the other hand, um, they live a long time and they can reproduce again and again and again. But they are very vulnerable to exploitation. Um, humans uh, harvest turtles for food and for medicine and, and for the pet trade, and that has devastated turtle populations around the world. And um, uh, it has Put, made turtles one of the most um, vulnerable uh, groups of, of animals uh, 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 around the world. So we're going to focus tonight on diamondback terrapins. This is the uh, one of several species of turtles that I study, and, and certainly uh, one of my favorites. This is an ex this picture is of, a, of an adult female and an adult male. So um, you can see that females are way, way, way bigger than the males. Uh, the males are very, very small compared to the females. Um, uh, but they, um, uh, you know, that's 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 as big as either one of them gets. You see that they're not like sea turtles. They don't. They're not as big as sea turtles. Um, but they are pretty good sized turtles. Um, you know, they're not tiny things. And um, you can see those big webbed feet they have. They're great swimmers. Um, and they live in uh, brackish water uh, off the coastlines of oceans. Uh, and and the mouths of rivers, where there are really strong currents, and and you know those those big strong feet are important for them to get around. They pretty much are only found in uh, Spartina marshes, the Atlantic salt marshes, from um, from Massachusetts through Texas, so all along the Atlantic and and, and Gulf coasts. So um, here's uh, here's kind of a graphic of that. So so they're all the way up there at the Cape Cod in Massachusetts, all the way along the coast around Florida and all the way down to, to a little past central Texas. Um, they're one of the few reptiles that uh, we've had really, have been really strongly and directly impacted by humans. And that's because they're tasty. Um, and uh, so certainly the Native Americans harvested them. Uh, certainly the early Europeans, when they came to the United States, they harvested them and probably in, in very large numbers. Um, and, and then it kind of peaked and slowed down and they weren't eaten, they weren't harvested all that much. And then in the late 1800s, early into the early 1900s, they were again, they became very popular as a food item again, and they were harvested very, very, very heavily. So all up and down the East Coast, people were harvesting uh, terrapins for food and shipping them all over the country. This picture here on the bottom left, that those are barrels of terrapins in Chicago that are on their way to places further west. So they were harvested somewhere along the Atlantic coast, barreled up and sent, and they're here. They're you know they're kind of at a midway point, and then they're going to be uh, sent out out west to, to uh, markets out west. Uh, so this was from uh, the, probably the, the 1920s or so. Uh, very very uh, harvested in gigantic numbers, and they became so valuable that people tried farming them. And this picture on the bottom right is of a of a terrapin mm. farm in, farm in South Carolina. And you can see this, the, you know, a, a gentleman here uh, feeding the terrapins to get them up to, to, to size for, for the mar for the harvest uh, for the uh, market. Um, and I don't know when this this little uh, clipping from a newspaper or magazine came from the one uh, that you see right here, where they were selling hatchling terrapins for twenty five cents. Um, but that's a real live pet turtle, and and I imagine that these farms were probably the source of a lot of those uh, those hatchling terrapins, because otherwise it would be hard to get enough hatchlings to really make it worth your while. Um, all of that uh, pretty much uh, resulted in terrapins being decimated throughout the uh, throughout the range, uh, and and he, even here on Long Island, uh, the word was that terrapins had been completely wiped out here on Long Island. I suspect that was not really true; that there were probably still some around, um, but that the numbers were were dramatically reduced from what they'd been before. Um, at the and also their habitat was under assault from a variety of sources. 
Yeah, as you got, as, as every birder knows, if you're interested in, in, in water birds at all, uh, we've lost a huge amount of the salt marshes along our coastlines uh, to for a whole variety of reasons. Some of them have been covered up with debris from from uh, from the mainland. Some of them were just dredged out. So um, this is a this is a steam powered dredge uh, 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 tearing up marshland um, along the coastline. And um, although most of that direct marsh losses has come to an end. We're still losing salt marshes through erosion. Um, and terrapins are also um, uh, killed a variety of other ways. Um, here's a picture of a crab trap that we that was found in Jamaica Bay, an abandoned crab trap um, that uh, since it was no longer being used for, uh, you know, since it was no being checked every day for crabs, um, it continued to catch terrapins. And so this is the dead terrapins that we found inside the crab trap. And crab pots like this in the, in, in, you know, in salt marshes catch, crab, catch terrapins and drown them for years and years and years until they finally, until the traps finally fall apart. So these are, these are death traps that just continue killing turtles. And they're, they're a real problem in a lot of places where people crab. Also, terrapins are hit on roads when they cross across roads. Uh, a lot of the birders have probably seen them. If you go by Ocean Parkway, uh, uh, you probably have seen uh, dead terrapins on the side of the road, uh, and that's uh, that's what you see. You know, we have here. Those, unfortunately, those are almost entirely nesting females. So those are really valuable animals that, to the population that are that are that are killed and, and the really really cr critical loss. And also we know pollution is probably important, although in ways that are very hard for us to understand. And um, so pollution is probably uh, detrimental to, to terrapins as well. A little bit more about terrapins and their background. They, they eat um, all sorts of crunchy things. They eat crustaceans, snails, crabs, uh, clams, uh, mollusks of various kinds, all sorts of things with exoskeletons. And um, uh, and, and after they eat those things, of course, they digest them. And they, they, when the females come up on shore to nest, they drop those, 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 uh, you know, the nutrients that they've absorbed, they turn those into eggs and they drop those on land. And that turns out to be an important food source for all sorts of animals on land. So terrapins are probably pretty important to the food chain, to the terrestrial food chain because of all the eggs that they, they bring on land. I mean, from their point of view, they don't, they're not trying to do that. That's not the goal, but you know, they, they are probably pretty important, not only to the raccoons, which are doing really well, but also on um, fox and mink that are, that are important species and, um, and some birds as well. We certainly know that crows and gulls um, eat uh, both eggs and, and hatchlings. All right, now I'm going to focus a little bit, actually, I'm going to focus for the rest of this talk about uh, our research specifically. Um, uh, in in uh, uh, I, uh, My team and I, we work almost exclusively at uh, Rulers Bar Hassock. That's the, the island, in the, the big island in the middle of Jamaica Bay. You guys know this. This is Cross Bay Boulevard right here. Uh, this is Rockaways out here. And this is the, uh, the a, a train that uh, comes along the east side of, of, uh, of, of Rulers Bar Hassock, or some people just call it Rulers Bar. This is all part of Gateway National Recreation Area. Um, this particular part of it is, is Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. So all the dark green is national park land uh, and um, the light green is city park land and the rest of it is, oh, you know the rest of it. The, uh, this is JFK over here and this is Brooklyn over here and this is Queens up here. You guys uh, know this area very well, I would imagine. And Jamaica Bay is really interesting to me, as as as, uh, as Linda said in my in her introduction. I've been very interested in how animals um, uh, uh, adapt to urban environments. Urban environments are very new, uh, and um, and and large and important. And and animals have to adapt to them or or or, or be eliminated from these areas. Jamaica Bay has had a long sister, history of very 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 serious pollutants, all the nasty pollutants. Uh, from DDT to uh, to metals to everything, radioactives, everything is in is in Jamaica Bay. Um, it has also had a long history of marsh loss. This is uh, one of the major islands, Elders Point, uh, and um, and then you can see that uh, years later, uh, much of it's been washed away. And Jamaica Bay has an ongoing marsh loss problem, and uh, that's certainly affecting the terrapins as well. And so these are severe challenges, perhaps, to the terrapin population in Jamaica Bay. 
Um, and before I even got started working in Jamaica Bay, the, the park people had done some work on, the, on, on terrapins there in the early 1980s. They had reported some remarkable things, things that were remarkable to me as a turtle biologist. They said that eggs that they saw being uh, uh, put in nests by turtles uh, had very, very high survivorship, as high as 93%. They said they saw no predation. There were no, there were no predators out there. Uh, and they did, they, they trapped for predators, for things like raccoons, and they never caught any predators. So they said there were no predators out there. So this was a sang and a real sanctuary from the terrapin point of view, where they could lay eggs and, and none of them got predated. So we started our work there in 1998, which um, uh, uh, you know means we've been doing this for coming on 25 years. Um, and um, uh, we started with the goal to just do the basic population ecology. We wanted to know, you know, how many turtles there are in the bay, uh, what factors determined, you know, whether the population was going up or down, um, how this was different from non-urban populations. And we wanted to focus on first the eggs and the hatchlings, then the, then the juveniles and subadults, and we were looking at survivorship and reproduction. And we've done this over all these years using a, a huge array of volunteers. Um, you may see some people you know in these pictures. Of course, I could not begin to put everybody on there. We have had well over uh, 2,000 vol different volunteers working on this project over the years. Some years we have over uh, 110 volunteers working. Um, we generally only work with um, uh, uh, college age kids and above, but we've made exceptions from time to time, as you can see from the pictures here. I've had high school students working with me. I've had um, retirees working with me. Uh, lots of school teachers come out when they get done with classes. So they come on the later half of the summer. And uh, so lots and lots of people over the years. And it's been one of the, certainly one of the greatest pleasures in doing this project has been my interaction with all these wonderful people. Some of whom came back year after year, after year, after year, after year. So we've had some return people and it's great because I don't have to train them again. Once they're trained once, they know how to do this. And every year we've done pretty much the standard things that ecologists do that you as, you as birders, you know that professional birders do these sorts of things too. We go out in the field a lot. We spend a lot of time walking through the habitat. We're looking for our animals. In this case, this is a terrapin that is in the early stages of laying its nest. We look for our animals doing what they do. Um, after they get done nesting, in this case, we mark them. And you can see this is me putting in a, uh, a, a pit tag into one of them. We use the standard little, little tags that we, that, you know, people put in dogs and cats. They're used in birds as well. If you don't band a bird, you, you might put a pit tag in it. And those are readable by a special reader uh, for the life of that animal that'll be usable. And we mark and measure them. And, um, you know, and here's, here's, uh, my uh, my child is now 28 years old, and 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 there and in this picture, um, I don't know how how old uh, how old in this picture. It's hard to say, but in any case, um, uh, here we are, you know, measuring measuring animals. So you know, we've been doing this a long time, and we do you know we have a very standardized routine that we do year after year after year. As far as the nests are concerned, sometimes we leave the nests alone and just see what happens. And uh, sometimes we see they've been predated. As you see here, these are all empty eggshells that have been predated. Sometimes we uh, dig them up before that happens and we count the number of eggs. And sometimes we put cages over them so the predators can't get them. And sometimes when, and when we do that, sometimes we come back and, and get the hatchlings out of there and we can mark and measure the hatchlings as well. So we've done different things with the eggs and the hatchlings in different years, depending on our particular goals in, in, in one year or the other. So I'm just gonna hit across some of the high points of the things that we found while we were, on all the years we've been doing this. And as I, as I go over these next several slides, uh, you're gonna see, um, you're gonna see pictures of the, of the graduate student or undergraduate I had working on that project that year. And also a lot of this work is published and, um, and here's the citation for the publications if you get, if you get interested in, at all. As a university pr uh, professor, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a, a, you know, a, a strong incentive to, uh, to publish the paper, to publish the work that we've done. And we publish a very large number of papers from this project. So it's, it's probably one of the most well-documented terrapin populations anywhere. Uh, so if you're ever interested in the scientific end of this, um, I can easily aim you at a, a, a pretty large collection of papers, more coming out all the time. So um, in this first slide about our results, 
uh, we we have uh, documented that these turtles have uh, temperature sex determination. This was already known, but the details were very vague, and we, we've ironed out a lot of the details. So if the eggs are incubated at relatively cool temperatures, of course that's that's Celsius, not uh, not Fahrenheit. Relatively co cool temperatures, we get 100% male hatchlings. Over a narrow threshold, we get males and females, and then at warm temperatures, we get all female hatchlings. And what that means in the field is that most of our nests turn out to be laid in pretty warm places. And so most of our nests are producing female hatchlings. So we've, we've done quite a number of years of monitoring female nest temperatures. And, and we know that, I mean, of nest, of nest temperatures, and we know that we're producing an, a strong bias for females. We've also pioneered the use of, uh, of tracking of hatchlings. So we could track hatchlings in the field. Um, and we actually use those same pit tags that we use for adults, actually a smaller version of the same pit tags. I've had two different students working on this. And so we, we put the pit tag in the turtle and then we can track them using this cool little device. We can see where our turtles are going. And we've learned lots of things about what the hatchlings do, um, including that the hatchlings, um, when they come out of the nest in, in, in the fall, as, as, as turtles normally do, instead of going into the water like most turtles do, instead they turn around and go up further on land. Land. And they spend their first winter in, on land buried deeper outside the nest, but buried in a hole that each individual hatchling dug. And then in the next spring, they come out again and make their way down to water in the next uh, in the next May. So they've they overwintered their first winter on land, which is a very weird thing. And, and I don't really have a very strong idea as to why they do that. Um, but um, this has been confirmed at, at other nesting sites as well. So this is it's not just a Jamaica Bay thing, but it happens at other places where terrapins live. And we're still studying uh, why they do this. This is uh, this is utterly unique in in, in all of turtles. We've also found that our females lay up to three clutches per year. Uh, the average clutch size is about 13 eggs. And all those clutches are laid uh, in uh, pretty much, I shouldn't say all, but most of them are laid in, in June and July, the, all of June and the first few weeks of July. Um, and now, contrary to what the Park Service people found early on before we started, uh, raccoons get about uh, an average about 95% of all the, all the nests. So any nest that we, excuse me, that we don't protect 95% of them are protected by, by uh, raccoons in the first night that, that they're laid. So that first night is the most dangerous time for the nest. Uh, almost all of them are predated that first night. Another batch of them is taken. If they survive the first night, they are taken in the second night. And then a few more are taken later. So we were really interested in what is it that makes that first night so vulnerable? Why do the raccoons get them in the first night? What's so special? And, and you guys could probably have some really good guesses there. Um, one thing we found was that um, it's strongly associated with rainfall. In other words, if a terrapin lays its nest during the day and it rains that evening, then it's very, very good chance that that nest will survive. And we've done some, some additional work that shows that what the raccoons are queuing in on, the way they're able to find these nests, is they can detect the smell of the freshly turned up soil. And uh, so you could just dig a hole in the ground and not even put eggs in it, just dig a hole in the ground, pat it back down again, and raccoons will dig that up that night. But if it rains, it washes away a lot of that smell. And so nests that are laid just before it rains, if it rains before the raccoons get to them, then the odds of them surviving are, are much, much, um, much, much better. Unfortunately, climate change models predict that um, uh, rainfall events during the summer are going to be less and less common over the future. So that's good for raccoons, but it's bad for terrapins. We've also detected an alarming trend in, um, in the number of, of, of turtles, uh, of nests being laid. Um, this is uh, this this figure I haven't updated in a few years. We stopped collecting these data when Sandy hit, but this is the number of nests that are laid per year on Rulers Bar and on this island in the middle of Jamaica Bay. And you can see that when we started our study, we had well over 2,000 nests being laid per year, and now it is down near a thousand. So about 50% decline in the number of nests being laid. Um, and there's a number of reasons that could happen. It could be because there are fewer turtles. It could be the same number of turtles are laying fewer nests. But I'm going to leave that question for a moment there and talk and switch topics. Then we're going to come back to that. And that is that in 2009, some of you might remember a really remarkable event happened in the turtle world. 
Uh, and it's also kind of a remarkable thing that happened in the JFK world. So uh, in 2009, there was an explosion of news stories about J Diamondback Terrapins nesting at, at JFK Airport. And this is what they saw. They saw turtles walking on their runways. Now, um, there's all sorts of news about this. Some of them were really, really funny. Um, this is uh, some of the pictures. Uh, there were pictures being circulated like this. This is the, the back of a pickup truck loaded with Diamondback Terrapins that was taken out at JFK. This is another picture. Some of you who are turtle people will recognize that these are not even terrapins. These are red-eared sliders taken from some uh, freshwater pond someplace. But nevertheless, uh, 2009, there were lots and lots and lots of, of, of terrapins uh, shutting down the runways. They closed down the runways because there were so many turtles on the runways. Now, to give you a little context, I want to point out that um, this is my study site that I've been talking to you about over here on Rulers Bar, mostly around West Pond. That's an area you guys probably know well. I don't do much work on the east side. I'll get back to that later on. And the airport mostly experienced this right here and this runway right here and along the sides here. All of these turtles uh, were, uh, most of the turtles were nesting right in there. That's about four and a half kilometers. That's, that's not very far. And certainly any of my terrapins could swim around and get over, get over there. That's not a great distance. They could do that kind of swim in one day. So unfortunately, um, um, airports, uh, uh, as you probably know, airports have wildlife uh, researchers who work there year round, and they're mostly interested in birds. And they collect a lot of data uh, on the, the wildlife that they see. And um, this is two types of data here in one slide. It's the number of terrapins moved off of runways. And remember this, this breakout of terrapins on, on the runways, that happened in 2009, that's right here. But here's data for years before that outbreak. And you can see they were moving terrapins, that's these blue, uh, blue diamonds. They were moving terrapins off the runways in very low numbers, less than 100 per year, for years before the outbreak. And then there's 2009, that's the outbreak. And then there's 2010 and there's 2011. So 2009, although that was the first year we all heard about terrapins out at the airport, the problem got a lot worse in subsequent years, 2010, 2011, and years after that. So that's the number of terrapins moved off the runways. In red here is the number of terrapins that were struck by aircraft. That's a different scale. You see that over here on the right. And so very, very few early on. But then in 2009, there were two that were hit by, by aircraft. In, um, in, uh, uh, in 2011, um, then um, that, that looks like that's a little bit uh, off. That looks like that should be four. There should be whole numbers. And then uh, as, as many as 11 in, in 2011. So, um, uh, so that suggests that terrapins have been at the airport all along, but something happened in 2009 that their numbers started really growing. Now, to put this into a bigger context, you should know that, um, you know, uh, uh, turtles are found at other airports, but turtles are not usually what the what, what the researchers at airports have to deal with. There are 6,600 uh, airports uh, wildlife strikes at airports every year in the United States, but 97% of those are birds, and none of you are probably surprised to hear about that. Most of the problems with animals at, at airports are birds, and I'll bet you guys some of you will remember this picture right here right? That's the famous aircraft that landed in the Hudson because it, uh, it left LaGuardia and hit a bunch of Canada geese. And, uh, and it ended up uh, crashing in, 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 the, in the Hudson. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, at, at Diamondback Terrapins, however, are the most commonly encountered reptile at, uh, at airports in the United States, not just JFK, but other places as well. Um, but all of the strikes, all the times that terrapins that have been hit any place have been at JFK. Terrapins make up 20% of, um, of all the turtle strikes and they make up the largest fraction of reptile strikes. So snakes are hit by planes sometimes when they're you know, taxiing in up or down. Um, and um, even, even iguanas are sometimes hit by planes when planes are landing or taking off in, in, the, in Florida. So um, right away in 2009, when, when that big, uh, 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 huge number of terrapins were found out at the airport, um, uh, I went over to the researchers there and I trained them in the techniques that we've been using for many years before that. And they started marking and measuring terrapins just like we have. And what they, uh, 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 by 2017, they had marked and measured 
um, over 2,600 terrapins at the airport. And to put that in comparison to us, we've mar we have marked and measured about uh, uh, less than half of that at Ruler's Bar. So they have a large population of terrapins that went from very small numbers to very large numbers um, at, at the airport. Now, one of my first concerns was maybe the reason that my terrapin numbers were going down was that a bunch of my terrapins had been moving from Ruler's Bar, the island of Ruler's Bar, over to the airport. So I was really glad when they started marking and measuring their animals. However, what we found was very, very few terrapins moved between these two sites. The ones that nest at Ruler's Bar only nest at Ruler's Bar, with very, very few exceptions, the ones that nest at the airport only nest at the airport. We get very little movement between them. So that's not why the numbers are declining at Ruler's Bar. We did notice that the, the two populations of turtles, the ones at Ruler's Bar and the ones at the airport are very different in a lot of ways. Um, the ones at Ruler's Bar have very high rates of, of damage, uh, shell damage of various kinds. Um, so lots of injuries. Some of these are raccoon attacks. Some of these are boat strikes. Um, and secondarily, uh, we know notice that those injuries, animals with injuries, had very high mortality rates. So the animals that have been hit, uh, uh, not surprisingly, are much more likely uh, to drop off the map. They're, they die. They, they disappear someplace out in the bay after that. So they have much lower survivorship. And the long-term population trends for these two different populations, you know, we have more data for Ruler's Bar. Uh, we estimate that originally in, in, you know, in, in the early 2000s, that population was about 744 animals. And now, um, right now, it's closer to 473. That's a 36% that's a decline, um, which is not a sustainable population. That means this population is, is, is sliding out of existence. The JFK population is actually stable. You see it bouncing up and down here. That's mostly because they have, the, the reason you see those numbers going up and down is mostly because their population is so large that it's hard for them to get good estimates of the population size. So it's always going to be vibrating, you know, bouncing up and down a little bit, the population estimate is, but it's a pretty stable population. So it probably is pretty steady there, even though it looks like it's going up and down. Those error bars, as you can see them, are quite large. Whereas the error bars for the Jeweler's Bar population are, are so small, they don't even appear on, on the slide. So um, the JFK population looks more variable, but that's simply because it's a larger population. It's harder to track it. So what the 20 years of data shows us is that these two populations, that first place that we have two large populations of terrapins in Jamaica Bay. And um, that's remarkable. That's not what I thought when we got started. Um, and that those two populations have very different survival rates. The JFK population is doing pretty well. The Ruler's Bar population is declining rapidly. Um, and we also know that the Ruler's Bar population has very high nest mortality. I didn't talk about it here, but we know that the JFK population, um, the, the nests have much higher survivorship. We know that there was a big hit when Hurricane Sandy went in, went through. The Ruler's Bar population took an unusually large hit. My name, or and um, and um, uh, and 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 uh, that was easy to see. But also that the Ruler's Bar population um, is more prone to injuries, and those injuries also are associated with lower survivorship. So at this point, after you know doing this work for this many years, we have a pretty good handle on what's going on with egg and nest survivorship. We have a pretty good understanding of what happens over that first winter. Remember, we track those hatchlings. We know what's going on there. We have a pretty good idea what's going on with the adults or female survivorship. And, and for the ruler's bar population, it isn't pretty. But there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet that's really, really important. So, for example, we don't know what the terrapins are doing when they're not nesting. There's a famous sea turtle biologist uh, uh, named Archie Carr who said many, many years ago that 99% of what we know about turtles is what they're doing 1% of the time. And that's true. Most of what we know about what any turtle species is doing is when they're on land. We don't know much about what they do when they're in the water. Now, for many species of turtles, we have a better understanding of it now because new technology has made that easier to do. But for terrapins, we still don't know what they're doing most of the time when they're in the water. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So as a result of that, we don't know what's causing the decline in the ruler's bar population. Most of that's happening out in the water. We don't know why those moms are dying. 
And we don't know if there are other nesting populations in Jamaica Bay. Uh, we haven't surveyed lots of the bay in many, many years. We just haven't had the funding to do it. And um, so we don't know if uh, new populations like the JFK population might have popped up and we just don't know. So the goals of our next 20 years are like this. The first thing is that we are trying to set up a system of trapping um, out in the bay so we can get we can locate turtles out in the water and we can do that with 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 these kinds of traps like you see here it's pretty inexpensive to do and we want to be able to of course trap our females and see where they're spending their time but also we can get data on the sub adults and the males and we can see if they have the same survivorship problems that the females do so we can compare the females to the other members of the population to see what they're doing and the other thing we want to do is track females. Now we can get some information about what the females are doing by, um, by trapping them out in the water. But what we really need to do is track their movements. And this is a really significant challenge. It's very, very hard to track terrapins. You know, we all see the wildlife videos on, on, uh, on uh, public television and such. They're very, very cool. They make it look so easy to track animals. But in the real world, it's considerably more difficult. And for terrapins, we, we face some really, really significant challenges. So right now, I'm, 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 I'm wrestling with two very, very different approaches. One is to buy a bunch of these GPS tags and put them on our turtles. Those tags cost $2,200 per, per tag, which means I can't track very many of them. They're very expensive. Or even more expensive would be to set up a, a uh, what's called a sonic tag system of, 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 of sensors throughout the bay, put sensors, uh, put transmitters on the animals and track our terrapins as they go around. The, um, uh, the positive side to that is that we could track other species as well. We could do horseshoe crabs, we could do uh, uh, selected fish, we could do sharks, anything that is, swims in the water, we'd be able to track all of them relatively cheaply once the sensor system was put in. That's gonna cost a lot of money to set up and I'm, I'm shopping around uh, to granting agencies right now, hoping I can find somebody that's willing to pony up the kind of money it's gonna do that, but yield a gigantic amount of information uh, from a, a relatively uh, a reasonable investment. Okay, with that, I'm gonna to start to wrap up here, guys. I'm gonna say thank you to the, to the many, many, many contributors who've helped gather, uh, uh, help with all the data collection, all the data that we've got there, data entry, analysis, all sorts of things over the year. We've gotten help from all sorts of folks. The Park Service folks have been wonderful. Um, the Jamaica Bay folks in particular have been really, really great. I've had lots and lots and lots of help from uh, uh, college students, from uh, nonprofits of various kinds have helped out. The American Literal Society has been great. A uh, lot of you know Alex Kay, who's been a, a, a steadfast colleague and assistant over the years. She's been fantastic. And um, lots of other kinds of volunteers uh, over the years. Uh, way, way, way too many for me to name. And with that, I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, maybe I've got some questions in the in the chat. And, but I would be happy to take questions from anybody who'd like to, I think you can unmute yourself and speak up, or maybe Linda, would you like to, to, um, to, um, to uh, uh, check people coming in or I can do it. It doesn't matter to me. How, how have you done this before? Let me take a look at the chat to see if anybody is on the chat that has questions. Yeah, I see I, a lot I, of people I, are I can, Brian, I, 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 I can moderate the chat if you want. We have- That's great. Um, uh, first question is, what is the best way to volunteer? Whom do I contact? Oh, that's a great question. Well, um, I definitely did talk a lot about my volunteers, but I'm going to tell you the sad angle of this. Since we switched over to working on uh, working on terrapins in the water rather than working with them on land, we're no longer running a volunteer program. And and I and I, and that's one of the part. I mean, I was a, it was a very very tough decision to make. I got to tell you because. I really came to love my summers working with volunteers out on the bay. But you know, I, you know, when we're running on boats all the time, like we are now, um, I can't take volunteers anymore. 
So I will tell you this much. Um, there is still a smaller scale volunteer program going on uh, with Terrapins at Jamaica Bay. And the folks at the American Literal Society are running that. So I'm not doing it anymore, but a smaller scale version of it will be, will be running this summer, I think. And um, if you talk to the uh, Northeastern chapter of the American Literal Society, Alex K there can get you plugged into a volunteer program there. So that's the good side of it. But you're not going to see me very much on it, guys. I'm going to be out in the water. I believe uh, the CTUC uh, Association is also uh, monitoring terrapins. And That's right. CTUC has got a, a really nice setup on their on their website. So if if you go any place on Long Island and you see uh, terrapins, uh, they encourage you to log that that sighting in on there. It's kind of like an iNaturalist thing, but sp specifically focusing on terrapins. And they're hoping to map out where on Long Island. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, where terrapins occur at, at, on Long Island. So if you see terrapins while you're out in the field or you're out birding or something, I encourage you to, to uh, uh, go to the SeaTuck site and, and, uh, and log that occurrence so that they, you know, to enhance their maps. It's a, it's a really cool thing they're doing. Okay, so we now have one comment and another question. The comment oh. is, please send your email and phone. I may try to see if your college would be interested in research with you. That's from Robert Alve. Oh, okay, sure. I know Robert. He and I go way, way back. We, 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 we. Uh, I talked to him. Um, I don't know a year or so after I came to Long Island, uh, and uh, and I was working on uh, Italian wall lizards at that point. So um, here, let me. I'm going to put it in the chat, and that'll probably work for everybody. And uh, let's do it. Uh, here we go. So anybody who would like to email me, or contact me, go right ahead. There's my email address, my, my name and email. So my email address is rburk974 at gmail.com. Okay, next question. What is the best way to help with the problem of terrapins trapped in commercial and private crab traps? That's a great question. And I wish there was a really easy way to plug into that. Um, there's, there's numerous attempts that go on in different parts of the terrapin range, all over the range, uh, where people uh, get money, usually from NOAA or one of the other federal agencies, to go out and actually locate these traps Traps and pull them out of the water. Some cases they're decades old, you know, and they've been killing not just terrapins, of course, they kill other animals too that go into them. Um, so far, we uh, have not been able to get anybody interested in funding uh, a project to do that in Jamaica Bay. Um, the, it's, it's kind of a circular logic here and see if you can follow me here. Um, crabbing is illegal in Jamaica Bay since it's a national park. So nobody's supposed to be able to crab there. But people do, of course, because, you know, we see people setting crabs out there. But because there's not supposed to be crab traps out there, it's hard to convince anybody that funds crab trap removal to take Jamaica Bay's problem seriously. Because when you do that, when you talk to them, they say, but there aren't supposed to be traps there. And you say, yes, I know that, but there are traps. And they say, yeah, but there aren't supposed to be. So um, it's hard to can get the funding to do the project. Um, what is the best way to plug in? You know what? Um, the P Again, I'm going to say that the folks who are pushing hardest to get a, get a program started for Jamaica Bay is um, is the folks at the Literal Society. Uh, Alex Kay has been working on that as well, and she and I have tried a couple of times now to get get funding for that. And um, and I and I'd say that they're the best chance that you know uh, of getting that done. Um, she's made some progress. She's definitely convinced some people that um, that we do have crab, we do have a crab trap problem in Jamaica Bay. And so hopefully we can get some funding to get out there with the with the boats that can detect the traps and we can pull them out. I, I believe out here on the island we have some local laws that that uh, regulate the, the type of traps that can be used so that the terrapins. That's don't right. Have That's right. Unfortunately, in Jamaica Bay, we have exactly the, the you know the, the same problem I was mentioning earlier. Since the crab traps are illegal anyway, the crabbers don't bother putting exclusion devices on them or anything like that because they know they're breaking the law anyway. Once they've broken one law, they break the others. So the traps that we do find out in the bay, we and we do find them quite regularly. They are they do not have excluders on them. They, these these crabbers are not interested in in you know anything like that. But you're right that the rest of, of Long Island, all of New York, um, many places, um, it, it's required that they have special devices on the mouth of the traps that are that keep out uh, uh, most of the terrapins, which helps prevent drowning. Next question: Is there a time of day that terrapins are more active, and best time to observe them in the Great South Bay? Also, where is the best type location to view them. 
that is on land or in water, along marsh edges or other? I love this question. I love the idea of people wanting to get out to see the terrapins because I think one of the one, most wonderful things about terrapins is, you know, how many reptiles can you reliably go out and observe doing stuff in, in, in their natural environment? There's just so few. Um, but if you, you know, and I tell people all the time, if, if you want to see a turtle nesting pretty reliably in June, anytime in June on a, on a warm day, you figure out what high tide is and you guys all know how to do that. You know, you take a tide chart out or go on the web and find a tide chart. You figure out when high tide is, walk the West Pond Trail on a warm day in June at high tide, you're going to see terrapins nesting. And you'll probably see a lot of them. So, you know, if you've got kids or you've got somebody who's never seen a turtle nesting or if you've never seen a turtle nesting and you want to see it happening, that's the way to do it. And I love saying that to birders because you guys, you all have binoculars, which means you can watch from far enough away that you're not going to disturb the turtle. So that's what you want to do. You want to walk along the trail. You want to be scanning well ahead of you for turtles. When you see them on the trail, you can park yourself right where you are, where you've got a good vantage point. Use your binoculars, watch them nest, and you can see them uh, on land there on the trail very, very conveniently or on the edge of the trail very conveniently. Now, if you want to see them in the water, it's harder to pick a good time, but they're active all summer long. So if you go around marshes uh, in uh, in the summertime, uh, if you're out in the bay or if you're along the shoreline and you're walking around, walking along and you can see the edges of marshes, your odds of seeing terrapins are are really good. Uh, terrapins are out, you know, swimming around all the time, especially with your binoculars, your spotting scopes, stuff like that. Your odds of seeing terrapins are pretty good. Okay. Next question: Is there any way to control the number of raccoons in Jamaica Bay? Well, I think the best way is if we increase traffic on Cross Bay Boulevard, um, because the main source of mortality seems to be road kills. But, oh man, you recorded me saying that, didn't you? Um, anyway. Uh, we can edit. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, I have tried for many, many, many years to convince the Park Service that they could reduce the number of raccoons on Ruler's Bar. Um, not only for terrapins, but of course, raccoons are major predators of, of ground nesting birds. And the biggest impact the, 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 the you know, the closest I've come to convincing them that they should do that has happened just recently when they realized that several of the islands in, in Jamaica Bay where herons used to nest, they don't nest anymore. And the word is that raccoons have set up shop on these islands. And after a couple of years of complete failure due to the raccoons, the herons have moved away. And so now the National Park Service is, is talking about maybe doing some raccoon reductions uh, on those islands and also at Ruler's Bar. So to bring back the, you know, so that the nesting birds will have safe places to nest. And I'm delighted. I mean, that, it'll help the terrapins. But if it, if it takes birds to, to, to improve conditions for terrapins, I'm all good with that. So I think we are finally moving in that direction. So, um, uh, uh, you know, that, they may that may happen as early as next year or the year after that, as early as 2024 or 2025. So, so stay tuned for that one. Okay, I have uh, two of my own questions. Go for it. Well, one is, uh, how has the recent marsh restoration around Jamaica Bay um, affected the, the terrapins? Well, right from the get-go, almost uh, within a month or two of, of when the equipment stopped being around the marsh, each of the uh, restoration sites, um, they started seeing terrapins out there. So, you know, when they go out to monitor the plants and stuff like that, terrapins were definitely curious and definitely checking out the, 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 new, the new islands or the restored islands right away. And I continue to hear about terrapins uh, out on the islands, uh, you know, in the marshes around the island. So that's all good. Um, uh, my guess is that terrapins are pretty good at, at discovering new sites like that and uh, and making use of them quickly. So so uh, I don't think that any of them are building new nesting habitat, but they're definitely building new marsh habitat, and that's places where terrapins can eat and and uh, and overwinter and good stuff like that. So uh, it's all good news. We need more. We need a lot more. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's not. It's a good start. And uh, my my second question is that uh, I believe there are barriers that can be put up so that terrapins can't get up to roads. And I'm just wondering why they're not used more. Yeah, uh, there are indeed. And, and this has been pioneered by um, the folks down at the Wetlands Institute in, uh, in South Jersey. And uh, it works really, really well. 
Um, that, well, actually, there's a lots of different people who do this, but the most successful systems that I've seen use um, these big black plastic tubing that you can roll out along the sides of the roads in the spring and um, stake in place, and you can take it back in again in in the in this in the at the end of the summer if you want to. They use these a lot at JFK at the airport now, and that's why they don't hit nearly so as many terrapins as they used to. They put these out every year and they bring them back in every fall, and it keeps a lot of the terrapins off the runways. Not a 100%, but a lot. So they're doing much better out there than they used to. The problem with that is it, it you know, somebody's got to buy it. Somebody's got to put it in place. Somebody's got to maintain it. Somebody's got to bring it back in again. So there are places on Long Island uh, where they do that. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, SeaTuck a little bit ago. Uh, John Turner at SeaTuck has, has, uh, has pushed the use of these um, up at Orient Point on the North Shore, and uh, it's worked out really well. Uh, they've kept terrapins off um, one of the uh, one of the main drives there where they were getting hit pretty often, and they put up this black tubing now, and it works really well to keep them off that. And so, um, you know, any place anybody wants to do it, they can. But I mean, within the laws and regulations, they can do that. But it's not easy, and it it takes some work to maintain all that. And um, you know, I would love to see it along Ocean Parkway from one end to the other, but you know, you can imagine that's, that would be really, really tough to do. You know, that's a lot, that's miles and miles and miles of, of tubing needed. So, you know, it's doable, but it's not, it's not trivial. It, it takes, it takes somebody who really wants to do it and the funding and manpower to make it work. Okay. So are there, are there any more questions? Uh, put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay. I um, see there's okay. a couple of chats I haven't seen yet. Okay. All right. Well, I very much appreciate being invited back. And, and if you guys want to invite me back uh, at some point in the future for, for another update, I'd be delighted to do that. Um, and uh, if anybody has any questions or comments or, or whatever they want to, uh, they, they, I've, I've set my email on the chat and I'd be, I'd be happy to hear from you. And we, we just like to thank you for speaking to us and, and for all the work you do. For, Thank you so uh, much, guys. Terrapins and, and all the other species that benefit from your work as well. I hope a lot of other species benefit from it. That's for sure. And and if the raccoon numbers are reduced, I imagine that um, that uh, you know there'll be some birds that are going to benefit from that too. So that's all great. All right. Next time, I hope we meet in person. By the way, that'd be really nice. That would be awesome. Yep. I look forward to that. All right, guys, have a good evening, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank everyone. you. Thank you very, very much. Good thing. Bye-bye.